The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is Isaiah chapter 14. We'll be focusing on verses 12 through 15. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with the message, The Problem of Evil, Part 2. What is the shortest definition of sin? I will. That's the shortest definition of sin. I will. The minute you say, I will, you're saying, I sin. If you're saying, I want what I want, and not saying, I want what God wants, I will. For thou hast said in thine heart, and read it, and he says five times, I will. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. Now here you find the details of the devil's merchandise, Lucifer's merchandise. It was I will. I'm going to run this myself. I'm going to take a little of the worship and credit. You don't have to have it all, God. You may be a creator, but I'm pretty wonderful myself, and I think I ought to get a little credit. And then there were two wills in the universe. I think I'm wise enough to originate a couple of plans by myself. And then there were two wills in the universe. Then there was sin. Now, in order to understand this, there's some things you've got to get out of your mind. Now, unfortunately, most people in the English-speaking world get their ideas about the devil from Dante's Inferno, Goethe's Faust, and Milton's Paradise Lost. They are all beautiful poetry and devilish theology, even Milton's Paradise Lost. For, you see, Milton has the devil sinning in heaven and being thrown out of heaven. But the Bible has the devil sinning on earth trying to get into heaven. For God created the devil and Lucifer and put him on this earth. Now this is the stage upon which the whole drama of sin and salvation and redemption is being played. So these five verses in the book of Isaiah where Lucifer says, I will, I want you to note that the first one was, I will ascend into heaven. Now that was the beginning of sin. Oh, but someone says, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Ah, uh, yes, but that was a prophetic utterance in what is known as the prophetic past tense because it has not taken place even yet. Satan is still in heaven as we see very definitely in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And the devil will be in heaven until the time of the Antichrist in the middle of the great tribulation at the time of the second coming of Christ. Now, when Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven, what was he really saying? Today we're well aware of military terms. We know that Eisenhower said, I will establish a bridgehead in Normandy. And then I will exploit that bridgehead and we will go on and we will go to the place we establish a bridgehead across the Rhine and we will move on in and conquer Germany. The idea of a bridgehead is a well-known idea. So what the devil really did, he said, I will ascend into heaven. Here I am on earth, says he, running a little corner of things but I'm so wonderful and I'm so beautiful, I ought to be much higher up to do this. I will ascend into heaven. Well, God let him. God let him establish a bridgehead in heaven. Now, in order to understand heaven, you've got to realize that heaven has an upper part and a lower part. You find this in Ephesians 1, for instance, that Jesus Christ, when he was raised from the dead, God took him into heaven and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above the principalities and powers. Now you can't have a far above without a far below. And when it says God set Jesus Christ far above the principalities and powers, this means that the principalities and powers were in heaven. And in Ephesians 6, Paul says these are the ones we wrestle against. How did they get in heaven? They got in heaven when the devil established his bridgehead in the lower part of heaven. 
and says, there's where I'm going to go. God says, just let him stay there. That's quite all right. I have a plan. This is all going to work out to my glory, for God knew every detail of it. Oh, dear friends, in all this, don't ever think that the devil is ever putting anything over on God. Years ago, my children were asking me some questions, and I, I wanted an answer, and I, I asked the Lord, I said, I, I'd like to write this in a parable so that the children will understand. And I, I wrote a parable in which I, I told the story of what the devil is doing and how he's being defeated. There was a man who had a magnificent estate, beautiful, gorgeous trees, great, magnificent place, and he had a bitter enemy. And the enemy hated him, and the enemy hated him, and the enemy hated this estate owner. And the enemy said, I think the thing that would get him the most is if I cut down one of his great, magnificent trees. He has these gorgeous trees there, and I'm going in in the dark of the moon, and I'm going to cut down one of the most beautiful of those trees. So in the dark of the moon, the enemy went in with saws and axes and wedges, and he started working, and he hated that man so much that he went on with the frenzy, and he cut that tree and worked at that tree till his hands were blistered and bleeding. And just at sunrise in the clear crystal dawn, he heard voices coming over the hill and he saw two horses. And he saw the owner of the estate and a friend come riding down. And the man redoubled his efforts, knocked out the wedge and the tree started to fall. And as it fell, it twisted and one of the branches caught him and pinned him through to the earth. Just as the estate owner came, and the enemy said, as he was dying, at any rate, I cut down your tree. The estate owner said, this is the architect of my new house. We are going to build a new house, and in order to build a new house, it was necessary to cut down one tree, and that's the tree you've been working on all night. My dear friends, anything that the devil ever did is cutting down a tree that God had planned to be cut down. If you don't believe this, you believe that there's a power greater than God. But once we understand the sovereignty of our almighty God, that he never made a mistake, that he knows the end from the beginning, and that in his own time he will bring all things under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here you see Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. And he did. The second thing he did was, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, that doesn't mean the stars we see out here with our eyes in the sky. The word stars is, has more than one meaning. If somebody goes to Southern California and sends you a postcard, I saw a lot of stars out here in Los Angeles, you won't know whether they've been to Hollywood or to Mount Palomar and looking through the 200-inch telescope. For if they've been looking through the telescope, they've seen one kind of stars, and they've been to Hollywood, they've seen another kind of stars. Now, in the Bible, the word stars means not only the ones that Paul saw, Castor and Pollux and the Orion and the others, but it's also the name of a rank of angels. When the morning stars sang together at the creation of the world, and just as there are angels that are called cherubs and seraphs, so there's a group of angels called the stars. And they are up at the throne of God. And Satan said, I will ascend above the stars of God. His third great thrust was, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, if you take the word congregation and look it up in the concordance, you'll discover that it means the congregation of Israel and the congregation and host of the angels in heaven. You'll find half a dozen references where it applies only to the angel hosts. And the devil says, that's what I want to be. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation of the host in the sides of the north. Now, I don't want to be arbitrary about this, but take a good concordance and look up the word north. You'll discover, for instance, in the Psalms, judgment comes not from the east, the west, or the south, but from God. Now, I don't know how it is that God is said to be in the north. This is what the scripture teaches in half a dozen different passages. If you take a good concordance, you'll find it. And here Satan says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
And God says, judgment comes not from east, west, or south, but from me. And then again, Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now, he's not talking about rain clouds, cirrocumulus clouds. He's talking about the cloud, the cloud of glory that was dark to the Egyptians and light to Israel, that hovered over the people that was upon the tabernacle. He's talking about the cloud of glory that shone round about the cloud that was in the transfiguration. He ascended into heaven, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And behold, he cometh with clouds, not rain clouds. He's talking about the glory of the Shekinah, the heavenly glory. And the devil said, I want above this. And then the key to it all is the last verse. I will be like the Most High. Hmm. Now, why did he choose that name? How many names of God do you know? How many names of God do you think there are? Well, years ago, one of my teachers wrote a book with a page meditation on different names of God. Father, Son, Spirit, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Wisdom, Jesus, Savior, Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, Bright Morning Star, Fairest of 10,000, all the combination names. Well, he wrote a page on 365 different names of God that are in the Bible. And one day I wanted to see what he said about a name of God that I found, and I looked and found that he left it out. And I said, oh dear me, I wonder how many others he left out. So I had to start, and I had to read the entire Bible through and check every name of God to see if he had it. And before I was through, I discovered that he'd missed about 25 other names. So I know that there are at least 390 different names of God in the Bible. Oh my, the strong tower, the name of the Lord God is a strong tower. He's a refuge, he's the rock, and oh, so many other names he gives himself. The shepherd, the king, and all the other names. Scores, scores, and scores of them. Now, why didn't the devil say, I will be like the comforter? <laughs> oh no. Why didn't the devil say, I'll be like the redeemer? Oh no. Why didn't he say, I'll be like the almighty? Oh no. He said, I'll be like the Most High. Now, why? Well, take a good concordance and look up the word Most High. And you discover the first time it was ever used is back in Genesis, when Abraham was coming home from the battle after having delivered Lot. And suddenly, a strange being, Melchizedek, came out. And it says that Melchizedek was the priest of El Elyon, the Most High God, possessor of of heaven and earth. That's my boy, says the devil. That's what I want to be like. I'll be like the most high possessor of heaven and earth. And you begin to see the character of this being. I will be like the most high. You see, the devil's rebellion was not at all, Lord God, would you move over and let me have a little corner? The devil's rebellion was, Lord God, get off the throne. I'm going to run it. And now you begin to see what sin really is. And I cannot conclude without taking you to the fact that when man first sinned, he did exactly the same thing. Oh, one of the most important things in the Bible is for us to realize that human sin, human sin did not come from Satan. Human sin came from Adam. Well, someone says, but, but the devil tempted Adam. I'll give anybody a thousand dollars that can find that the devil tempted Adam. The devil tempted Eve. And you go to 1 Timothy in chapter 2, and it says flatly that Adam was not seduced by the devil. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve and Adam. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And there's one of the most important theological facts in the Bible. Sin did not come to this human race from the devil. It came in a fresh rebellion on the part of Adam. God had said, Adam, you're not to eat of that fruit. And when Adam was away, Eve was seduced. Eve ate of the fruit. She ate of this fruit. As far as I'm concerned, it was literal fruit. She ate it and she thought, isn't Adam going to be pleased with me? She was deceived. 
This, by the way, is the reason why God says there are not to be women preachers. Now, this may surprise some people. I'm not teaching that one sex is superior to the other. Everybody knows that a woman is infinitely superior to a man at being a woman. And a man is infinitely superior to a woman at being a man. As long as they are what God meant them to be, it's wonderful. Now, the scripture gives us this very great thing. A woman can be deceived as Satan deceived her on the softest side of her nature. Because the devil came along and said, you're a mother, aren't you? You're the potential mother. You're the wife. Yes. Well, how would you like to have a raise for your husband and a college education for your children? I can give it to you. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when Adam came home at noon, Eve was dancing up and down. Adam, I got a bargain and I did it all by my little self. You'll be so pleased. I did it. And Adam wasn't deceived for one second. Adam was not deceived for a moment. Adam was a rebel. He was not seduced. What he did was to say, God Almighty, you've given me everything north of this tree, everything south of this tree, everything east of this tree, and everything west of this tree, and I don't want any of it if I can't have it all. I want to run things. I want to be God. And that's why God never blames the woman for original sin. It's only in the funny paper that Eve gets the human race into trouble. In the Bible, it's as in Adam all died. By one man sin entered, and death passed upon the race, for that all have sinned. So we must understand that the sin of man is not the sin of the devil transferred to humanity. And that's one of the most important theological doctrines we can ever get. Because as long as you think that sin came into this world by the devil, then you're going to say, well, after all, what could we do about it? We're just little human beings. But when you understand that Adam was put there by God and he said, just as the devil had said, Lucifer had said, I will be like the most high. Man said, I'm going to be that myself. And don't ever think that when man sinned, he left God's side and went to the devil's side. For there's another error the devil likes to make people think that man is on the devil's side. It's not true, it's not true, it's not true. Human nature hates the devil. If the devil had his way, all mankind would be good and lovely without Christ. And the reason the devil can never have his kingdom upon this earth is because man won't go along with him. Man won't do what the devil wants done. God wants holiness. Satan wants to run things by himself. And man wants to run things by himself. And in Genesis 3, God says, I created the hatred that exists between man and the devil. Don't forget that. Genesis 3. God said, I will put enmity, hatred. I, God, will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And that hatred is there. And Jesus said, Satan's kingdom is divided against itself and it cannot stand. And the reason it cannot stand is that the devil wants to be God and man wants to be God. And over there it was Mussolini said, I'll be God here. Hitler said, no, I'll be God here. And Stalin says, wait a minute, it's I who am going to be God. And all over the earth, men are wanting to be God. And in their little ways, in Montgomery, Alabama, and in Philadelphia, men say, God, I'm going to run this. And all your trouble comes from the fact that you want to play God and run your life to suit yourself, instead of being submitted to him and allow him to run your life. Well, dear friends, we face this problem. It's there in the word. And God tells us that iniquity came would take me another hour to take you to the end and show you that the day will come when the kingdoms of this earth shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. May I close with this analogy? Listen to me. Back in the Old Testament, the devil said, I will ascend. I will exalt. I will sit. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I will go up, 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 up. And God said, Thou shalt be brought down to earth. 
But in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself, took upon him the form of a servant, being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself to the death, even the death of the cross. The devil said, I will go up, 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 up. Jesus Christ said, I will go down, 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 down. Wherefore God hath highly exalted Christ and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. While Satan, when he said, I will, I will, I will, the next verse says, thou shalt be brought down to hell. And let me tell you, in your own life, if you say, I'm going to go up, up, you're going to end in despair and disappointment and frustration. But the day when you come to the place where you say, Lord, I am willing to be nothing in thy hands, in that moment, God will take the littleness of you and will make it great and will fill the emptiness with himself. And you will learn that the eternal principle is the principle that the Lord Jesus has taught that the true way to up is down. Down, down to the cross in order that we may reach the throne of God. And that's where God will bring every one of us down to the cross that we may go up to the throne in Christ's way. Shall we bow in prayer? Our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take these great simplicities to our hearts. We know, Lord, that there are many things that have been spoken, some of which may be hard to be understood. We ask thee that thy people may be teachable, that above all they may not take anything because man has said it, but be like those in Berea when Paul preached, who heard the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things are true. Bless this pastor, this people. Use to thy glory the word that is spoken in Jesus' name. Amen.